it was more than a hockey game. It was us against them. It was freedom versus communism. Nobody gave us a hope in Halloween. It was a sliver of the Cold War played out on a sheet of ice. Here you have a bunch of fresh-faced college kids taking on the big, bad Soviet bear in the United States, in the Olympics. The confluence of events was so extraordinary, it can never happen again. Nobody paid attention to what Americans said in the world anymore. Our hostages had been taken, and we couldn't get them back. The Red Army went into Afghanistan. We couldn't get them out. It might have been the all-time low point for American public self-esteem. Who knew that these kids would become the vehicle for making people feel excited and proud again to wave a flag? It was a miracle. David slew Goliath. It was the greatest sports moment of the 20th century. America. For many, it is a word that conjures up images of a land of miracles where anything is possible. But that's not how it was in much of the 1970s, when a darkness seemed to hang over the nation. There was Kent State, and final defeat in Vietnam. There was Watergate, and Three Mile Island. There were long lines at the gas station, exorbitant interest rates at the bank, and at the end of the decade, an overwhelming image signifying just how powerless we'd become. No one could know that it would be, of all things, a hockey game, played by 20 American kids, filled with optimism and determination that would rejuvenate the American spirit and become a symbol of national pride. No one could know how important one game could possibly be to a nation that seemed to be losing its way. Certainly not in 1979, when a weary America heard from its embattled leader, who told us we were a nation in crisis. It is a crisis of confidence. It is a crisis that strikes at the very heart and soul and spirit of our national will. President Carter was seen as a, an expression of the American self-doubt and lack of self-confidence of the mid-70s. Our public support was eroding rapidly. You could feel it when you're out with people, when you're giving speeches, when you're shaking hands. America, I think, had begun to wonder whether we'd lost our edge. At the end of the 70s, American amateur hockey was suffering the same malaise as the nation itself. In the 20 years since winning the gold medal at the 1960 Olympics, American teams had become increasingly unable to compete with the dominant Europeans, especially the Soviet Union, whose players were amateurs in name only. The Americans were always amateurs, college kids, some of them, or recent graduates who still played the game, but certainly not at the, at the Russian level. There was no way that they could be competitive. And the feeling going into 1980 was they really haven't got much of a chance, even though it's here in Lake Placid. The goal was to avoid being embarrassed at home. So in July of 1979, the best amateur players in the country were invited to try out for the 1980 Olympic team. They invited us all to Colorado Springs and they divided us up into four teams. Basically, Eastern guys, Michigan guys, Minnesota guys, and an at-large team. Over the course of 10 days in Colorado Springs, those four teams played a round robin. It was a nerve-wracking situation. It was a, a pressure-packed situation. And, and as that tournament went on, it was being evaluated by Herb Brooks. Mike, gets up, Mike. Herb Brooks never went to charm school. Get it off, get it off, quick. If he had, he would have flunked out. How would you call it a hook on that stand? He was abrasive. There's two teams playing this thing, stand. Intense. Right, JC hooked him. Get in it, that game now, will ya? He was also the best college hockey coach in the country. People were a little afraid of him. 
He had always been considered kind of an outsider, had his own way of thinking, his own way of doing things. And he had a history with the Olympic team. As a University of Minnesota player, Brooks thought he had made the team in 1960. He was even in the team picture. But at the last minute, coach Jack Riley added a new player to the roster, and someone had to go. The someone was Herb Brooks, cut just one day before the team left for the games. Back home in Minnesota, Brooks watched with his father as his old teammates beat Czechoslovakia and won America's first gold medal in ice hockey. When we won it, my father looked over and says, well, looks like Coach Riley cut the right guy, didn't he? So, a uh, true story, and I, you know, it sort of hit me right between the eyes. That left unfinished business in Herb Brooks' life. He had something to prove. He was on a mission. A mission to shake American hockey out of its slumber. First, Brooks had to trim the roster from 80 to 26. So he began by keeping the players he knew best, ones who had helped him win three NCAA championships at the University of Minnesota in the 70s. They included Mike Ramsey and Bill Baker, Neil Broughton and Rob McClanahan, Eric Strobel and Buzz Schneider. But Brooks knew he couldn't be provincial. Herb wanted to make sure that it didn't look like a Minnesota team because he was from Minnesota. He wanted to make sure there was a good balance. So Brooks looked eastward to another college hockey powerhouse, Boston University, where he got Jack O'Callaghan, a defenseman with an attitude, and Michael Ruzioni, whose name in Italian means eruption, perfectly fitting his personality. To fill the most important role, Brooks picked 22-year-old Jim Craig, who'd been playing goaltender since he began skating on the frozen ponds of New England. I started to play goal because I didn't know the rules. And I figured, you know, it's not too hard. He's just supposed to keep that puck out of the net. He kept the puck out of the net as well as any amateur goaltender around, but spent his college years playing with a broken heart, following the death of his mother, Margaret, from cancer. His father, Donald, took the loss extremely hard. I think when my mother passed away, a piece of my father left he was so lost. He was a shell of himself. I, I think death and the tragedy of that brought us really, really close together. I spent a lot of time with Jimmy. I talked to Jimmy an awful lot. Jimmy was the guy in my mind that I thought we had to put the saddle on. Brooks filled out the team with gritty players like Mark Johnson from the University of Wisconsin, John Harrington and Mark Pavlich from Minnesota Duluth, Kenny Morrow from Bowling Green, and tapped others mostly from colleges in the upper Midwest. They were tough and fast and disciplined. But compared to the world's best, the players who were called amateurs, but in reality played hockey for a living, the Americans were just a bunch of kids, not feared and not respected. We were by far the youngest, most inexperienced team when it came to the Olympic Games. We were just college kids playing flat out, professional, older, stronger, better, you know, athletes, so it was a real formidable task. Behind the Iron Curtain, another intense coach was preparing his team for Lake Placid. But Viktor Tikhonov didn't have any of Herb Brooks's problems. The Soviets were the best hockey team in the world, and everybody knew it. So Tikhonov's goal was simple, to return home to Moscow with his nation's fifth straight Olympic hockey gold medal. That his own players despised him meant nothing. I would say he was a fanatic, thinking of hockey 24 hours per day. He wanted that the Soviet Union or Russia will be number one everywhere and anywhere. And he wanted that every player who plays for him will think the same way. The players hated him big time. The life was intense, practically without family, children or hobbies. It was only work. Vladislav Tretiak grew up just outside of Moscow and became immersed in the Soviet sports machine at a young age. He developed into perhaps the greatest goaltender to ever play and starred on the Soviet national team for over 15 years. We lived in camps for nine months out of the year. We trained, studied theory and practiced three times a day. It was a difficult and harsh life. I saw my wife and children rarely. But the thing is, I loved hockey very much. I thought that's the way it should be, and I was ready to sacrifice and put discipline ahead of everything in order to be first and for my team to win. Tretiak and his teammates were first, year after year. 
their lives and careers were controlled by the Soviet government, because technically, they were soldiers in the Red Army, but only technically. I went from a private to lieutenant colonel, but didn't do any army stuff. For the most part, we were fully devoted to hockey. By 1980, Boris Mikhailov was already a 10-year veteran of the Soviet national team and the most recognizable face in international hockey. Sport was tied with politics, and any victory had big political undertones, especially during the Olympic Games, when the general secretary and everybody else was worried about how we would represent our country. Our task was only to place first. Mikhailov and his teammates represented the Soviet Union by demolishing just about anyone who got in their way. They were government-sponsored magicians on ice who had been dominating international hockey since the darkest days of the Cold War. It was a dynasty, definitely, for 10, 20, 30 years. Their main goal was to win in every game, every period, every shift. And it was one regular season when they won 43 out of 44 games. 64, 68, 72, 76, right up until 1980, the Soviets were unbeatable in the Olympics. They played hockey the way we played basketball, with the same kind of control of the puck, the same kind of intricate offensive patterns, and of course the presence and goal of Tretiak. How could you beat him? Back in the U.S., Herb Brooks had been contemplating that same question for years. They could execute at such a high level of speed, skating, passing, shooting, thinking. I tried to develop a team that would throw their game right back at them. But first, Brooks would have to get his players to start thinking as a team, which wouldn't be easy. The rivalry between the University of Minnesota and Boston University was one of the fiercest in all of college hockey. And regional tensions between many of the new teammates ran high. As much as I was a Boston hockey player and I had pride in my roots as a Boston hockey player, I had an enemy, and my enemy was the University of Minnesota. There was a huge difference, I think, between the, the guys from out east and the guys from out west. You know, they'd come in with their fancy clothes and talking trash, and, and there's us guys, you know, we're just kind of, you know, got a little bit different outlook on everything. The Boston guys, you know, we thought we were pretty savvy and, you know, there were guys that didn't lock their doors or left their wallets out in plain sight. We thought, you know, these guys are a bunch of hicks from the cow pastures. I wanted to blur the, the boundaries of our country, build a we and an us in ourselves as opposed to an I, me, myself. Our spirit was going to be a big asset and you can't have that type of thing if you have pockets of individuals and that there's not those team building exercises throughout the year. Starting in August of 79, Brooks began employing his main team-building exercise, beginning a rugged six-month pre-Olympic training program with a strategy. To bond them as a team, his players needed one common enemy, him. Herb always liked that, where it would be you against him. You know, he was the bad guy. He liked being in that bad guy role. I remember when he told us, I'll be a coach, but I won't be a friend. And I'm like, Whew. Wow, this is going to be a long year. Herbie threw compliments around like manhole covers. He quoted in the paper that I had a million dollar set of legs and a 10 cent fart for a brain. He'd give you that glare and that look and it's like, oh my God, what did I do wrong now? I can honestly say that uh, there was no sense of regionalism on that team. There was a sense of Herbieism. And if Herbieism had a language, it could be found in a tiny notebook the players secretly kept documenting each moment their coach began to sound like a cross between Yogi Berra and Casey Stengel. The players called his strange motivational sayings, Brooksisms. A couple of my favorite Brooksisms on our team, you don't have enough talent to win on talent alone. There's a fine line between guts and brains. You look like a monkey screwing a football, whatever that meant, I'm not sure. Ramsey, you're playing, you're playing worse and worse every day, and right now you're playing like it's next week. Carrington, you're playing worse every day, and right now you're playing like the middle of next month. Christoph, you suck. You know, you're getting worse every day, and today you're playing like next month. I mean, that was a, that was a tip work, but he was right. And his strategy was working. Herb Brooks was transforming them into a team. Our Olympic team got very tight with the idea that it was us versus him. And we're constantly, as a group, trying to prove to him that we're good enough to play. It was Herbie bashing from day one until the final day of the Olympics. It, it really made them a unit. As September arrived, it was time to start playing against future Olympic competition. 
so Brooks took the team to Europe for a series of exhibition games. The Americans started out strong, winning six of their first eight, but Brooks kept pressing. Before a game against Norway, a team they would have to face at the Olympics, he issued a challenge. I said, guys, we're going to have to play the Norwegians in qualifications. So we do it tonight. We send the message right now. But playing flat and uninspired hockey, the U.S. could only muster a 3-3 tie, and Brooks was furious. As we went to get off the ice, Herbie ran from the bench down to the gate and said, stay out on the ice. Steam's coming out of his ears. He's so hot that we had tied Norway, which was the weakest team we had played over there. If that's all we can do is tie the Norway national team 3-3, and you think you're going to go to the Olympics and be successful, you've got another guest coming. He's standing there with his suit on, and he makes us all get behind the net and on the goal line, and he starts blowing his whistle. And we did what are called Herbies, which are blue line back, red line back, far blue line back, all the way down and back. Two or three of those would be tiring. Blue line back, red line back, blue line back, down and back. Ten or twelve of them would be excessive. <laughs> and we did them for about 45 minutes to an hour. The rink attendant turned the lights off on us, and we still skated in the dark. In the dark, he's screaming at us. Booming voice around this empty arena, you know. It was pretty intense. The message went out right then. They're not going to play the game like that and disgrace their abilities or our collective efforts. No one knows exactly how many Herbies were done that night, but to the players, it was a turning point. And that moment probably had more to do with us gelling as a team, feeling like we were a group, a family. We looked at each other and said, you know, basically he can do anything he wants to us. He's not going to break us. Returning from Europe, the team continued its grueling schedule of competition in the United States, and they went on a tear, winning 30 of their 41 games through the fall of 1979. Around Christmas time, we played in a pre-Olympic tournament in Lake Placid. We played the Russian national B team, who were pretty darn good. And the Americans beat the Soviet junior varsity team 5-3, to three, winning the tournament and gold medals to go with it. But the smiles on their faces hit an uneasy feeling on the team, because despite all the wins, Herb Brooks wasn't satisfied. I didn't like our, our team then. I didn't like the, the chemistry of our team. And since only 20 players were allowed on the Olympic roster, there were still six cuts to come. Brooks was making it clear that no one was safe, not even the team captain. Two weeks before the Olympic Games, he calls me in. He's going to cut me from the team. You're not good enough. You shouldn't be here. I never should have taken you. I'm going to send you back. And I'm thinking, he might just do this. <laughs> you know, I'm like, wow. The word got down that Arruzioni's job was in jeopardy. So everyone said, if he'll cut the captain, where do I stand? Which was exactly what Brooks wanted. Turning the screws even tighter, he was bringing in new players for tryouts just weeks before the Olympics, provoking the same fear in his players that Brooks himself experienced in 1960, when he was cut from the Olympic team at the last minute. But this was a new generation of player, and they'd had enough. And I said, you know, Herb, I don't think you should do it. I think it's wrong. We're going to Lake Placid in a week. I mean, stop it. Get rid of these guys and let us get serious about this. And I was looking for that moment where their cohesiveness and strength of association was such a strong bond, and then I would just cut the cord. And that was the moment. Brooks sent the late additions back home. He trimmed the roster to 20 and kept his captain. Herb never did anything on a whim. He planned. And I think he felt like that maybe this was the last test to see how close these players really are. I'm sure Herbie walked away from that and said, you know, maybe we got a shot. The team was finally set, and their confidence was building thanks to an outstanding 42-15-3 record against world-class competition. But before the Olympics, the Americans had one more test to take. On February 9th, 1980, at Madison Square Garden in New York City, they skated onto the ice to play a fundraising exhibition game, just three days before the start of the Olympics. But to their opponents on this night, it wasn't just an exhibition. Because any time the Soviet Union's top team played against Americans, they played to win. The Soviets had just recently embarrassed the NHL All-Stars in a three-game series, winning the Challenge Cup on American ice. With the Olympics only days away, they were rolling over opponents 
like a red tidal wave. They were the red menace and they wore the CCCP across their chests and they were very, very intimidating. You had heard about them, you'd known how good they were, you'd known about their successes, and now you were gonna play them. And that night it was, welcome to the real world, boys. We got crushed, and we thought, these guys are in another world. They just kicked us around that rink. The goals they scored were, you could have filmed them, they were so beautiful. They were like robots. When they scored a goal, they never smiled. I don't think I ever saw them smile. We were about ready to stand up and applaud them, because we didn't see anything like that before. You guys hitting now, but you see that goal, did you see his move? It's like, we were spectators. I looked up at the scoreboard, it said 10 to three. It might as well have said 20 to nothing. 10-3 made it sound closer than it was. It was no contest. There couldn't have been a greater low point given the preparation and the, and the work that we had put in. It was very demoralizing. This dose of hockey reality brought U.S. hopes back to earth. As each team left New York City for upstate Lake Placid, their futures seemed clear. Anybody who left Madison Square Garden that day thought to themselves, the Soviets will win every game in the Olympics take home the gold medal, and never be challenged. In the U.S., all you knew is that when it came time to face the big bear, they had no chance. As discouraging as the loss to the Soviets was, it was not something heavy on the minds of Americans. Throughout 1979, as the hockey team was preparing to compete in the Olympics, Americans at large were also competing with the harsh realities of everyday life. Look at the economy. Look how much money we're paying for gas. Inflation was absolutely ridiculous. People just didn't feel good about the United States. A lot of people wondered where we were headed. And then in November, just when things seemed like they couldn't get worse. This is NBC Nightly News. They did. With Jessica Savage. Good evening. The American embassy in Tehran is in the hands of Muslim students tonight. Spurred on by an anti-American speech by the Ayatollah Khomeini, they stormed the embassy and took dozens of American hostages. On November 4th, which was a really rainy day, a hundred or so Iranian students climbed over the walls of the U.S. Embassy, yelling, Magbar America, death to America. In a few seconds, uh, the door was knocked down and Iranians with automatic weapons uh, stood right in front of me and uh, held them against my head. This morning, for the first time since the hostages were put under lock and key, one of the captives, blindfolded, was brought out into the open. He is Harry Rosen, the embassy's press attaché. Barry Rosen and 51 other Americans would be held hostage in Iran for the next 444 days. We were bound hand and foot with guards in our room, weren't permitted to speak at all. You do not see a day of sunlight they would come into our cells and hold us up against the wall and use an automatic weapon and count from 10 to one just to scare us. The defining moment of the late 70s for Americans was the hostage crisis in Iran. Here we couldn't do anything to help these people who were being held hostage by these radicals. Americans were intensely frustrated by this. Carter tries to frighten us on the economic front. He does not have the military courage to attack us. It was a constant nightly embarrassment to all Americans to see our influence in the world seemingly ebbing away. Every night on the evening news, they'd burn an American flag for us. We were not feeling very good about ourselves. In December, it would get even worse. Day 54 in Iran, and while there has been no significant change in the hostage situation, there has been a major development in the country next door to Iran, Afghanistan. During the last three days, more than 5,000 Soviet combat troops have been airlifted into Kabul. Up to another 50,000 Soviet troops have massed along Afghanistan's northern border. As one administration official said privately, this is the grossest piece of international behavior in some time. The period after the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan was uh, one of the tensest periods of the entire Cold War. It was always potentially dangerous 
situation that if it ever had gotten out of control would have meant the end of the world as we knew it. It's very important for the world to realize how serious a threat the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan is. So serious that President Carter's response put the entire world on alert. We instituted draft registration, we escalated the defense budget, and we called upon the world to boycott the Summer Olympics in Moscow. When Carter announced the boycott, it was one more thing that seemed to be adding to the national sense of malaise, is that now our team's not going to go either? Because we have no other way of convincing the Russians to leave Afghanistan? But in the world of superpower chess, Carter's threat to boycott the Summer Games in Moscow led to speculation of a Soviet counter move, that perhaps they would launch their own boycott of Lake Placid. But with the Olympics just days away, the Soviets decided to fight it out on the playing fields of America. The Cold War was getting colder by the day, and incentive would not be a problem for the Soviet athletes. Newspapers were full of articles like blaming Americans for everything. So an attitude for the entire Olympic team, let's show them who we are. Let's show them who are the greatest. Let's show them who are the strongest. And let's show them on their soil. The Winter Olympics began on February 12th, 1980, day 100 of the hostage crisis. As the Soviet Union's athletes marched in the opening ceremonies, the Soviet army continued its own march across Afghanistan. Jimmy Carter had said that unless the Russians were out of Afghanistan in February, the boycott was on. So this cloud was hanging over these games. International tension wasn't the only problem affecting the Winter Games. As athletes and fans descended on the tiny village of Lake Placid in New York's Adirondack Mountains, the transportation system broke down. Buses often weren't available, and thousands spent hours stranded in the cold. America's crisis of confidence seemed to be reaching its peak. The Lake Placid Games did not start out uh, with the spirit of optimism and success. It looked like uh, yet another opportunity for us to get kicked in the teeth in the way in which we seemed to be all over the map. Nobody felt good, nobody felt proud, and we come along. Well, right now, I think the Russians are the greatest hockey team in the world. I think we can object uh, objectively say that by the teams they've beaten. Historically speaking, you have to look at the Czechs and the Swedes as favorites for the uh, silver and bronze medals. After that, it's the United States, the West Germans, the Canadians, and the Finns, teams that all have a chance for an upset. No one was expecting a showdown between the Americans and the Soviets. The teams were in separate brackets and would play only if each got to the medal round. The Soviets were expected to be there. The Americans weren't. I know you guys are really facing a Herculean task here. Uh, <laughs> it's like sending you into the lion's cage. Do you feel like that? Uh, yes, we do. You know, you got to be realistic about things. We're, we're a young team. We're the youngest Olympic hockey team ever. If you had to pick us, I think it would probably be picked fifth. We were anticipating getting the gold medals because we were the strongest team. The Czech team wasn't very strong. The Swedes weren't strong either. The Americans never really counted as an opponent. Therefore, there was nobody really to compete with. The Soviets barely had to compete in the early rounds as they breezed past Japan and the Netherlands by a combined score of 33 to 4. The Americans opened against heavily favored Sweden and playing a nervous and tentative game trailed 2-1 late in the final period. I remember the U.S. had several opportunities to tie the game and you just got the feeling and of course as the clock ticks down and now you're under a minute, well it's, it's not to be. With only 41 seconds left, Brooks pulled Jim Craig from the goal putting an extra skater on the ice, but leaving the American net empty. It was a desperate move for a desperate team. Fighting for control of the puck with 29 seconds to play. Baker on it, Freddie! No Baker! He was just trying to get it on net. And I couldn't believe it when it went in, you know. Look at that scene on the ice! You can always wonder if Billy doesn't score, what happens to the hockey team? Well, Billy did score. And the Americans in the key game. That was the biggest goal of the Olympics because if the Americans lose that game, they're virtually out of contention before the Olympic Games start. It's the horn sounds to end it. The U.S. 2 and Sweden 2. Two days later, the Americans faced Czechoslovakia, underdogs again, 
in a game they had to win. Many people said that the Czechs were considered the second best team in the world and the only team that had a chance to beat the Soviets. Well, we pretty much dominated the Czechs. Late in the third period, as the Americans were skating to a 7-3 victory, Mark Johnson was knocked to the ice from a cheap shot by a Czechoslovakian player. The injured American player right there, number 10, Mark Johnson. As Johnson lay injured, Americans watching on television were introduced to Herb Brooks, up close and personal. Herb Brooks. Well, it was in the glorious moment. Uh, well, it would be upset. Eat that goddamn go-ho train. If you're going to do something to our guy, I'm going to take this stick and I'm going to stuff it down your throat. People were ready to hear that kind of thing. He would not have sat back and let the Ayatollah stomp all over the U.S. while holding a bunch of hostages. I think that was one of the moments where a lot of people in this country said, hey, they've got a pretty good little story taking place here. We have these fresh-faced kids. Got to keep an eye on these guys. And look at this coach. I mean, he's right there, backing his players. Now, you get a tie against the Swedes, you get a win over the Czechs, and you can sense it starting to build. You can sense the interest in America. They're now taking notice of these kids who are starting to turn this tournament on its ear. So everybody's starting to look ahead to this prospective matchup against the Soviets, but before that, you have three other games. Norway figured to be the easiest of the games, and it was. There is Pavlich who gets it back to Selk, who scores! Davy Selk from Mark Pavlich. Then you had Romania. Restar, he scores! And they won that game. Germany presented a little bit of a problem, though, on, on Wednesday night, the last game prior to going into the medal round. Germany leads 2-0. So wait a second, what's going on here? You, you don't want this bump in the road. You don't want it now. And then the U.S. is able to come from behind and beat Germany. So they did all of the things they had to do. But then, of course, you had the specter of the, the Soviets just looming there. The Soviets looming in the medal round with an undefeated record and overflowing confidence. Seemingly no one, certainly not a bunch of college kids, could stop them from winning the gold medal. One of the ministers of the Soviet sport who was uh, responsible for hockey, he told that basically, you know, guys, I'm not congratulating you yet, but uh, we're very close. Czechoslovakian team didn't qualify. Americans are students. We beat them any time of the day or night. We are on top of the world already. We were way stronger. Nobody ever doubted that. We were professionals, and they were just students. Simply put, we did not respect that team, and you cannot do that in hockey. After studying the Soviets for years, Herb Brooks could sense their overconfidence and told his team to take advantage of it. I kept whetting their appetites. Someone will beat those guys. Someone's going to beat those guys. I don't like how they're playing. They think they're better than they are. But if the Soviets did not respect the Americans, Brooks felt his players were giving too much respect to the Soviets. So he began chipping away at their mystique by poking fun at their leader, one of the top players in the world, who just happened to look an awful lot like a famous comedian. Boris Mikhailov was as close to, I mean, the hockey chief of the world as there was. And Herbie starts teasing the guy all week. Look at that guy's nose. God, look at that guy's face. Looks like Stan Laurel. And he's insulting the guy. Look at Tikhonov. Look at his head. He looks like a chicken, you know. And he's laughing. These Russians think they are anyway, you know. Ha, ha, ha. Can't play against Stan Laurel. Piece of cake, guys. To relax them, to keep them focused, and also plan and say, hey, someone's going to beat those son of a guns. The first medal round game had been scheduled months in advance for Friday, February 22nd at 5 p.m. Not exactly prime time. But then nobody had expected it would be a match between the world's superpowers at a moment of escalating international tension. There was some talk about the game being shifted from 5 o'clock to 8 o'clock because people wanted national television. Uh, we were told the Soviets said absolutely not. The game will be played at 5, like schedule. So ABC Television made the decision to tape the game at 5, 
but wait until 8 to broadcast it. So here, in this just most bizarre and freakish circumstance, you have a 5 o'clock game on a Friday where people are filing into a building in daylight, going to a semi-matinee. Little would anybody understand that it would be, you know, maybe the most memorable sports event they would ever go to in their lives. The excitement, the tension building, the Olympic Center building to capacity. I'm sure there are a lot of people in this building who do not know the difference between a blue line and a closed line. It's irrelevant. It doesn't matter because what we have at hand, the rarest of sporting events, an event that needs no buildup, no superfluous adjectives. In the locker room before the game, Herb Brooks gave the speech of his life. He told us we were born to be a player. We were meant to be here. This moment was ours. And he told that story about going up and spitting in the eye of the tiger. If this is our time, it's not their time. Screw them, Stan Laurel, all those Russians. It's our turn. But I remember they taking the first step and looking up and around, and it was packed, overflowed, flags everywhere. There was a buzz and electricity around the arena. USA against Russia. USA against Russia. The intensity and the hatred is incredible. You don't want to hit somebody against the board. You want to put through the boards. And I remember a telegram we got from a lady in Texas. And all the telegram said was, beat those commie bastards. You realized that the USA on the front of your sweater meant that you were playing for your country. For decades, the Cold War had a way of flaring up in all sorts of hot spots. On this day, it would be a small hockey rink in a little town in the Adirondack Mountains. On this day, February 22nd, 1980, the only thing placid around here was the lake. Here we go as the game is underway. The Soviet Union in red and the United States in white. I remember for the first five or six minutes feeling as though I couldn't feel my feet on the ice. The Americans sensed even a couple minutes in that this was going to be a little different game. They were skating with a determination and purpose they had not shown earlier against the Soviets at Madison Square Garden. The Americans were so strong in the first period, it was unexpected for us. They played very fast and very emotionally in all aspects. It made no difference. The Soviets struck first. Schneider, losing it after the point. Slap shot, and it was deflected in. And the Soviet Union leads one to nothing at the 9-12 mark of the first period. The Russians scored first, and you winced and thought, here it comes. But the U.S. team took that blow. Craig made some key saves. And then Buzzy Schneider came down the left wing. Pavlich up ahead to Schneider. Shot, shot, goes in! Buzz Schneider! That's the type of goal you don't expect somebody like Freddie Ack to give up. And the United States ties the game at 14.03 in the period. The tying goal failed to unnerve the Soviets. They quickly scored again and it looked like the first period would end with them leading two to one. But with just seconds remaining, the methodical team that almost never made mistakes made the worst kind, a mental error, and it changed the course of the game. Davy Christian has the puck. It's about five seconds left to go in the period. I start to skate to the bench thinking the period's over. I remember seeing Mark Johnson go scooting up. Like, he just didn't stop playing. He was still playing. The Russians had stopped. Long shot, the easy save by Trediak, but Johnson is there and scores with one second to play in the period. Right now, the clock shows nothing, but it was stopped at one when we looked up as the goal was scored, and the United States has tied the game. I was going hard to the net, the defenseman just sort of let me go by him. I picked the puck up off a rebound and was able to put the puck in. We relaxed a little bit. We thought that the period was over and the horn would sound. Unfortunately, that was a big mistake. The bigger mistake, as far as Herb Brooks was concerned, was that the Soviets weren't taking the Americans seriously. He had said it all week when he was teasing the Russians. These guys think they're going to walk through everybody. Look how cocky they are. They're not here to play hockey. They're here to trade jeans and you know, have a vacation and go home with the gold medal. They're not serious about this. But Soviet coach Viktor Tikhonov was serious. So much so that he did the unthinkable and replaced the best goalie in the world. 
I went to the locker room and was preparing to play on. But Tikhanov came in and said, Tretiak is playing poorly and will not play in the second period. That was it. But the new Soviet goaltender didn't have to worry in the second period because his teammates were playing like they wanted to end the illusion that the Americans really had a chance. They quickly scored the go-ahead goal. And dominated the action, outshooting the Americans 12-2 in the second period. Only Jim Craig's brilliance in goal prevented the game from becoming a blowout. Slap shot saved by Craig, saved off the rebound and a whistle. My goal in every game was to keep the team that I played for in a position to win. And a Pierbukin. Pierbukin slap shot is covered up by Jim Craig. If you're going to beat a team as good as they were, you needed your goaltender to play well. And when we did make mistakes, Jimmy came up with big saves. And the second period is over. The Olympic Ice Center is still the Soviet Union 3 and the United States 2. We're only a goal down. We'd been there throughout the Olympic Games. We were down to Sweden, we were down to West Germany. This is no big deal, no big difference for us. Just keep playing, keep going. It comes down to that last 20 minutes, and now you've got a hockey game, and one that you can have a chance to win at. But the Americans had never come from behind against the best team in the world, and the Soviets always dominated the third period. It looked as if this night would be no different, until lightning struck. Dave Silk. Cuts across, throws it towards the net. It happens to come right on my stick. And now, to me, the game takes on a whole new outlook. Three, three. Now it's a hockey game. A hockey game that wouldn't stay tied for long, because just 81 seconds later, the team captain, whose name in Italian means eruption, triggered one. Puck bounces out to me coming over the blue line. You know, as, as my friends say to me to this day, if, you know, three more inches to the left, you'd be painting bridges. The U.S. team is depending a little bit too much now on Jim Craig. He's making too many good saves. And that's when the building went crazy. I mean, that's when sound had feel. I mean, that was like an earthquake. Now we've got that look. Oh, I love what the atmosphere in that arena was incredible. The, the feeling, the sense that they could do this, that they could actually pull it off. That goal coming at the 10 minute mark, exactly halfway through the period. When I sat on, I looked up and I went, 10 minutes. It's a long time against these guys. They could score in 10 minutes what would take us 60 minutes to score, and I knew that. Lebedev now, out in front of Krutov, and it looked like it hit the post. It did, it did. Maltzev was wide open, there he's again. The Russians had always beaten everybody right down the end, and they weren't worried. The Sakhanov slap shot, knocked down in front, loved by Craig, and a whistle. Too much time, too much time. We can't hold them off this long. It was just a constant clock watch, shift by shift, shift by shift. Eight and a half minutes to play. The Americans now leading 4-3. It went on forever. The time just stood still. Five and a half minutes to play. Three-fifty-three remaining in the game. Herb kept reminding us to stay with your game. Just play your game, play your game. I'm saying it over and over again. Play your, play your game. Play your game. We were making plays again, blocking shots. Benesov, slap shot is blocked in front by Morrow. 225, 224, 223 remaining. It kept building and building, and the clock kept winding down, and it just got louder and louder. 55 seconds, but Mikhailov has the puck. Mikhailov squeezing in, out in front, backhander goes wide. I think Craig would have got a piece of it. Until the last minute, I thought we would beat them. To lose? That was not possible. 28 seconds. The crowd going insane. Parliament. Shooting it into the American end again. The only thing that came into my mind was the word miraculous. 
and the miraculous became a question. able to go out there and kind of hug each other and just look at each other. You know, oh, God, you know, the Russians and God, oh, God, we couldn't even talk. Jack O'Callaghan, he comes bombing out on the ice. First guy, he hits me and I'll, I'll take that picture to my grave with me. And I'll never forget, we had that one shot of one of the Soviet players, his chin up against the top of his stick. And he had such a curious look on his face. I mean, it was almost as if he was enjoying this a little bit. We won so often that we no longer felt the thrill that the Americans showed. On one hand, it was great to see their emotions, but for us, it was very bitter. Since the game didn't air on live television in the Soviet Union either, it wasn't until Saturday morning that Soviet hockey fans heard the stunning news. When the word got out that the Soviets lost and the game was shown in replay, nobody believed in that. First of all, it's lost to the Americans. Second of all, it's lost to the Americans on American soil. And then, which is the most embarrassing, you lose to the college guys. Are they drunk or what? What happened? In Lake Placid and all over the United States, the victory triggered an outpouring of national emotion never before provoked by a sporting event. We hadn't had a reason to feel patriotic as a country for a long time. And this was a reason, and it was a good reason. We were able to be proud of ourselves again. We beat the Russians. It was we, it wasn't they, it wasn't the US kids. It was we beat the Russians. As the nation continued celebrating, for the hockey team, it wasn't over yet. People always forget that the US had to win another game on Sunday. It was still possible. If the Americans did not beat the Finns, that they would not only not win the gold, they wouldn't win any medal at all. And Herb understood this. And we were excited, we were anxious, we couldn't wait to get out and play. And Herb Brooks walked into the locker room, and he looked at us and he said, if you lose this game, you'll take it to your fucking grave. Then he stopped, he walked a couple of steps, turned, looked at us again, and said, your fucking grave. Everybody rising is one now. It just was electricity going through my body. It's like, this is it. I mean, the, the, the crowd sensed it, and we sensed it. And here we go with a chance. It's become so familiar all week. USA, USA. And something else became familiar. Once again, the Americans would have to come from behind. It comes toward the point and deflected in, out in front by Nico Leinanen. Suddenly, the Americans fall behind. After two periods, they're behind two to one. We're gonna win the greatest game of all time and lose to a bunch of friggin' Finns? Before the third period, the 20 American kids who had come together as strangers seven months earlier, with a dream to win any medal, decided to use their last 20 minutes as a team to take the gold by force. There's no way that Finland is keeping a gold medal from us. And we went out there in the third period and I think we just steamrolled them from the time they opened that door and let us out. They didn't have a chance. Johnson to McClellan, and he scores! Johnson's getting in the shot, but we can't be score! Three unanswered goals in the third period gave the U.S. a 4-2 win and the gold medal. Five seconds to the gold medal.
In the jubilance that followed the victory, goaltender Jim Craig looked into the stands, searching for his best friend. Jim Craig looking for his father in the stands. I was looking for him just to show respect that it wouldn't be great if Mum was still here today and to appreciate all he had done. She was terrific. Just too bad she wasn't around long enough to see the reaps of the reward, at least down here. I'm sure she was a big part of it up where she was. We are proud now to present the victors in the ice hockey competition. Someone said, hold your hand over your heart and sing like a bird. And I went right down the line. Just to see your flag being risen just a little higher than everybody else's, and to hear your anthem being played in your own country, it was really special. To us, this was our war, you know? This was our chance to go out there and put on that American flag and put on that uniform and go out there and fight for our country. Us winning the gold medal didn't solve the Iranian crisis, didn't pull the Soviets out of Afghanistan, but people felt better. People were proud. People felt good about being American because they could relate to who we were. We were working class, lunch pail, hard hat kids who represented them in an athletic event that was far greater than a hockey game. turned and looked at my teammates and they were looking at me and I was looking at them. Nobody told us what to do. Just kind of called them all up on, on the podium. I mean, we all wanted to be together on that podium. Our arms around each other and our medals around and we're checking out each other's medals. And... I remember looking down and thinking, how did I get all those guys up off of this little square? Maybe that was a miracle as well. The team had bonded so closely that there they were, fingers in the air, signifying this incredible triumph. In the end, it was the camaraderie, the unit that was developed. That was something special. Those guys, <clears throat> well, those guys deserve that medal. This was a, a real genuine love affair by young people that respected one another. That was the period, the chapter, the verse, the end of the story for me right then. For the second place team, returning home to the Soviet Union without the gold medal was an unfamiliar task. When you win the silver medal, it's an honor, but not in the Soviet Union. When we arrived back home, we wanted to quickly hide from the shame in the airport. In the streets, people were saying, how come you lost? And to whom? Some students? At a Kremlin reception for the Soviet Olympic athletes, Viktor Tikhonov, the coach who lost to the Americans, met with Soviet Premier Leonid Brezhnev and tried to explain what went wrong. Brezhnev was talking to Tikhonov, and Tikhonov, he didn't cry, but he was just saying, we'll try to win, this is just a fluke. And Brezhnev like, almost hugged him and said, Victor, I know you're better than Americans. It wasn't until the American team arrived in Washington, D.C. for a reception at the White House that it began to sink in just how much their victory had revitalized the nation's spirit. There were people lined up all over the place. They were hanging Russians in effigy. They had signs up. They were screaming. They wouldn't let the buses move. We had motorcades. After greeting a grateful President Carter, something else began to sink in. This would be the last time they would ever all be together as a team. We're having lunch and everything's going really cool and then it was time to leave. Time to go home, hey, see ya. And I was, kind of, see ya? I mean, this is it. It's over. From that point on, that team has never been together. All 20 players have never been together. We've had some reunions. We've had 18 
19 guys show up. We haven't had an event where we've got all our players back together under one roof. It wasn't until almost a year after Lake Placid that the truest impact of the American victory was felt by 52 Americans who didn't have the chance to watch the game when it was played. When we did come back, there was a video put together by the State Department about what went on during the entire time that we were taken hostage, ending with the Olympic hockey game. And I can tell you that all of us as hostages watched that and applauded most for that one more than anything else. For me, who just came out of Iran, it was one of the happiest things to really see. I spent 14 and a half months in deep captivity and there, you know, I'm exposed to this wonderful sight of Americans going crazy over a hockey game. I wish I had been there. That, that was my only regret. I do believe in miracles. I don't think I'll ever see a miracle of that magnitude again in the world of sports. Yes, I do believe in miracles. In the hockey world history, I would put it as miracle number one. Beating a team like ours was an event. So I believe in miracles. Yes, I do believe. This is a bunch of talented, dedicated, wonderful guys who took and believed in one goal and took all their own personal satisfactions away to achieve it. If that's a miracle, I believe in that. I do believe in miracles by virtue of the fact that I'm sitting here now. Captivity shows you the depravity of human beings. I think the hockey game showed you the apogee of how things can happen in life. This was a case where for, for a few hours at least, a magical coach got a magical group of kids to believe that they could do something that they really couldn't do. Is that a miracle? Yeah. This has been a presentation of HBO Sports, the network of champions.